today for our study, I want to continue briefly where we started last week on the book of Galatians. And I hope over the next little while to uh, also touch after Galatians, the book of Ephesians. Then we'll go back to Romans. But in between the studies in Galatians, Ephesians, Romans, uh, we will go to Colossians as well. Uh, we will need to take a little break. And the reason for that break is simply this. Because of my personal life uh, as growing up as a Seventh-day Adventist, and because we have many friends and relatives who follow us online, there are some questions that I need to address even before we start studying the books of Ephesians and Romans and uh, Colossians with reference to uh, the Gospels and the message of grace. Because we will touch on and actually we will dive into the book of Revelation and Daniel where the conclusion of the matter of redemption takes place in the book of Revelation. Because that's where the plan that was started in Genesis concludes and finds its resolution in Revelation. And in order, to us, in order for us to understand Revelation properly, we have to understand the plan of redemption as God gave it to us, starting in Genesis, and then through the other covenants. Therefore, we are studying the covenants. But in order for us to get a clear, unadulterated message that is completely from the Bible, I need to deal with what theology it is that takes people away from biblical teaching and into a new teaching or a new gospel that is not biblical. We have to find that source. Why is it like that? And when I speak about people, I'm talking about my own family, about my brothers, sisters in Christ who grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist church as I did. Friends. Pastors. So, although this church does not have members that are all from a Seventh-day Adventist background and neither are all people that are watching online, but you'll allow me to or indulge me to go ahead and address the question of Seventh-day Adventist teachings and where they come from. And in doing so, I have no choice but to deal with the prophet of Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ellen G. White. And to that end, I will be taking one, possibly two weeks, to request all people in this church and online and wherever they hear the message to examine what I offer as questions and take the writings and the teachings of Ellen G. White and the claims of Ellen G. White and put them against the Bible. And to do so, I will present many prophecies that Ellen White claimed were given to her by God that were never fulfilled within the time frame that she claimed God told her they will be fulfilled. I will present some scientific claims, knowledge that she had, or she claimed to have that God gave her. That is not scientific at all, but completely proven to be wrong. I will show you some doctrinal passages that she claims that are completely antithetical to the teachings of the Apostle Paul and Jesus himself. And the reason this is important is that if we're going to study the Bible and the Bible alone, we have to know what influence is also brought to bear on the doctrines that are being taught to the people. One of our elders called me not long ago 
and asked me, he said, what about this particular Bible commentator? What do you think of this Bible commentary? I told him a little bit of what I knew because I have that commentary and I use it. I explained to him that when we take any Bible commentary, we need to know who the writer is, who the Bible commentator is, and what is his background. Is he come, does he come from a Calvinist background? Does he come from a Wesleyan background? Does he come from a Lutheran background? Is his thinking covenant theology? Is it new covenant theology? Is it dispensational theology? It is important to know what Bible commentaries we're using to interpret the scripture. Because if we don't know who we're reading, whose interpretation we're following, then we may be misled in our understanding of the Bible. Therefore, it is absolutely imperative for us to know who Ellen White was, who she claimed to be, what influenced her life, and what claims she made that were absolutely false. And I invite all of you to examine her teachings and her claims in light of Deuteronomy 13 and 18, which states this, that any person who claims to be a prophet of God, and if they make one prophecy that is incorrect, and not in line with the word of God, in the Old Testament, they were told to be killed. We're not going to kill anybody. But I would invite you to take the claims of such a prophet and set them aside and lift up your Bible and your Bible alone. To that end, next week and the week following, I will be dealing with Ellen White and her status as a prophet, whether she's a prophet of God or a false prophet. And it will be my duty and it will be my expectation to show that Ellen White is not a prophet of God. And if my Seventh-day Adventist theologians, members, friends, can respond to my assertions, I would invite you to do so privately, online, or publicly. But we would like biblical answers, not answers that hide the truth. With that said, I'd like to study today's sermon by giving you a bit of a summary on the covenants. And then with that, we will go on and understand where we as sinners stand with God. By way of summary, we have been discussing the covenants when Adam and Eve sinned, they realized that they had done something wrong. They had broken the law of God. And the very first thing they knew, the first thing they realized that something, that something was wrong, that they became aware of their nakedness. That nakedness that they became aware of is a symbol of what happened in that relationship. It broke that relationship. Where the two were one and had no shame, now began to feel a certain level of shame. Not only did they hide themselves from each other, they began to hide from God. When God came to be with them, where did they go? They went and hid. In an attempt to cover their shame, their nakedness, which was also a symbol of sin. They themselves of their own effort sewed together some leaves and they covered themselves. They attempted to cover themselves. And God then came and he slew an animal and he covered them with skins. In that action of God covering the sins of Adam and Eve, we see all the work of God 
that covers the nakedness completely. And we see the work and the attempt of Adam and Eve to cover their shame and to cover their sinfulness. We see that as utterly useless. So the work of God, the grace of God, the gift of the covering of sin started right where sin began. There are those I would have us believe that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant is a covenant of law. And the New Testament is a covenant of grace. That is not true. Why do they say that? Because there's a misunderstanding of the covenant of Moses, the Sinai covenant. You find this especially with dispensational theology. But let's proceed with what happens. After the sin, and, the sin entered the world, and the world became evil and left God, that association, that communication with God diminished. The world became so bad that God wanted to destroy the world. And who did God pick? God picked Noah. And what happened with Noah? When God picked Noah, go with me to Genesis chapter 6 and find Noah. We should have gone to Genesis 3 for Adam and Eve, but we didn't. So we'll continue with Genesis chapter 6 now. By the way, if you're looking to find the experience of Adam and Eve with Jesus, uh, with God covering the sins of Adam uh, and Eve, go to Genesis 3. You'll find that there. We're going now to Genesis chapter 6. By the way, for those of you that were noticing that I was still making notes uh, while I was waiting to get up here, I was trying to reduce what I can present today. There's just too much material. And I was trying to cut out what I should just cut out and just keep this as, as, as short as I can, but it's still very difficult to present everything. Now we're in chapter 6 of Genesis, verse 8. And this is what we find. God did not find Noah to be a perfectly righteous person who was living by the laws. He was not a man who was righteous because of his works. Noah was righteous by the grace of God. In the verse 7 of chapter 6, So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that, uh, that move along the ground. For I regret that I made them. But Noah found what? Grace. In some, in some translations you find the word favor. The actual translation in the book of, uh, in, in the King James Version, which is more appropriate. Noah found what? He found grace in the eyes of God. Once again, we find that God saved Noah, not because Noah was living a righteous life and because God accepted his righteousness. God lifted Noah where he was among the people who were sinful, and he gave him his grace. The next covenant we find in Abraham. In Abraham, we find chapter 12. God told Abraham to take up all your stuff, leave your land, leave your people, leave your name. I will give you a new land. I will give you a new name, and I will give you a new people. Get up and go. And Abraham did. Abraham's people were people that were idol worshippers. They were pagans. His father made idols. And we know from Abraham's life after chapter 12 that Abraham was not a righteous man. He was hardly a righteous man. But how did God save Abraham and why? Verse 6 of chapter 15. In Genesis, Abraham had asked, but he's not called Abraham yet. Abraham says to God, how will I know that I will have seed? How will I know that I will have land and so on? Chapter 15, verse 6 says this, Abraham did what? Believed and he credited it to him, righteousness. It was not the works of Abraham, it was the belief of Abraham. So once again we find what? 
the laws that are saving Abraham or grace. There are those who mistakenly think that the major covenant, the most important covenant in the Old Testament is the Mosaic or the Sinai covenant. I note that a good friend of ours who is uh, actually a great Bible student uh, attends a church, uh, the Southern Asia SDA church, uh, posted a note on, uh, on Facebook with regards to last week's sermon. And part of what he said surprised me a little bit because he said, oh, Galatians addresses the law of Moses, not the Abrahamic covenant. It, it, it disregarded the Abrahamic covenant. And he went on to explain that. I was suspicious as to how a person who studies the Bible as much as my friend does could make a statement like that. So I'm going to assume that the post that was put in there was not really his own thought, maybe somebody else's thought, because he understands the scripture better than that. As we go through the book of Galatians, we understand that Paul himself right then and there, he says, this was a gospel of, that God gave to Abraham. And then chapter 4 cites uh, Sarah and Hagar. It's all about Abraham and that covenant. And where does the Mosaic covenant fit in? This is very, very, very important for us to know, my friends. Mosaic covenant does not override the Abrahamic covenant. The Mosaic covenant is part of, it is a sub-covenant within the Abrahamic covenant, which is the all-encompassing covenant. And how is that? The Abrahamic covenant says, I will give you a land and I will give you seed, that through that seed all nations may be saved. And how are all nations going to be saved? Through Jesus Christ, that seed which is promised to the next covenant, which is David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So, the Abrahamic covenant covers all the covenants. The Mosaic covenant is a sub-covenant within the Abrahamic covenant. Why? Because as part of the getting of that special land of Canaan, God put together, he brought these people out of Egypt. And he went, when he brought them out of Egypt, he prepared them for Canaan that they may inherit that land and that they may succeed in that land. And in that land and from that land would come the seed of Abraham that would save the world. Now, the covenant that was given to Moses, uh, the covenant that was given, I should say, through Moses, was threefold. One was the moral law. The second was the ceremonial law. The third was a civil law. Now, God said to them, as long as you live within these laws, you will be good to inherit that land. In order for you to inherit that land, I want you to do this. Live like this. And he told them what to eat, what not to eat, the various celebrations, the annual feasts and so on. And all those annual feasts, by the way, they all ended up and pointed to the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement, I'm going to take a little bit of a break here, by the way. The Day of, the day of Atonement is not when the judgment started. So those I believe that the Day of Atonement starts what is called in Adventist circles, investigative judgment, that is a complete untruth. The judgment in the Jewish calendar started on the first day of the month of Tishri, where people were called by the trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets. They were called to confess their sins for those 10 days. And on the 10th day of the month of Tishri, it was the Day of Atonement. At this point, they would not eat, they would fast, and they would pray. Because here, with the Day of Atonement, where the priest was going to take and put the blood of the Lamb on the mercy seat. And what is the mercy seat? The mercy seat is not where you're judged by the law. The mercy seat is where you, you have already went through the judgment the first 10 days and you've confessed your sins. Now you're coming to God and you're being covered. 
Your sins are being covered by the blood of the Lamb. And the day of atonement was when the verdict from God would come. So if you go to court, which I did last week, I had uh, an issue to deal with the fire department. Oh, I said, well, my tenants were like this and they did this and so on. They said, yeah, but you're the landlord, so you got to do this. So they went through this trial. Now they said, okay, we got to make another day for the verdict. June 6th is the day of the verdict. Now, the judgment has taken place. The evidence has been presented. The trial is over. The day of judgment now is only the day of verdict, not the presenting of my wrongdoing or my defense. So the day of atonement was a day when God would give their verdict, give his verdict. That was the day when they took the sins and eventually we'll, we'll have a deeper study on this. And I'll just finish off, but here's how the day of atonement ended. They used to tie a ribbon around the horns of the scapegoat and another ribbon in the sanctuary. And by that they knew, I will tell you details about it later, whether God accepted their confession of sins for the last 10 days or not. The day of atonement is not when the judgment starts. It is not where the investigative judgment starts. Don't let anybody fool you with lies. No such thing. Now, in the sanctuary, how were the people saved? The people, the Jewish people, under the laws of Moses, under the, Mos uh, under the Mosaic covenant, how were the people saved? They were not saved by their works. The moral law let them know if they were right with God or if they were not right with God. And they found that they were not right with God. They would then bring sacrifices for their sins. And the sacrifice would be anything from fine flour to a bull, depending on how well off you were. And then at the end of the year, you were given an opportunity as a nation, not individually, as the nation, to be accepted or rejected by God. That was the Day of Atonement. But salvation was never earned in the Old Testament by the working of the law. The expectation of keeping the law was not to gain salvation, but to gain the land of Canaan and the symbolic land of Canaan that we have here, which represents heaven, comes by the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ by his blood. It was by his blood. Therefore, the Ten Commandments are taken and put where? They were put inside the Ark of the Covenant. And they were covered by what? They were covered by this gold cover. And that gold cover was where they had the two cherubs. And on the Day of Atonement, they could, the high priest would expect that God's presence would come. And it was the mercy, it was the grace of God that saved the people, not the works. What about Samuel? Sorry, what about David? This is the next covenant. Was David declared righteous because... Of his great works? No. Go to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. Chapter 13. Sorry, chapter 12. 2 Samuel 12. And verse 13. This is why God loved David. And referred to David. As a man after my own heart. You know why? Because David confessed his sins. 
you read Psalm 51, David deals with his most well-known sin and how he cries before God for his sin. David doesn't all of a sudden become a righteous man. He still has problems in his life after that. Read with me. 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. Then David said to Nathan the prophet, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. God forgave David, and God called him a man after my own heart because of his confession. It was the grace of God. It was the grace of God that saved David. Now, when we come into the experience of the New Testament, which starts with Jesus Christ. When Jesus came, he came with the message of salvation by grace. By grace. To that, let's go to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. And verse 12. Actually, before we do that, let's go to Galatians. Galatians, because that's where we were last week. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 19. Galatians chapter 2, verse 19. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. What's that? We've seen all through the Old Testament, it was the grace of God that saved. The Apostle Paul says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law... Christ died for nothing. King James, will say, uh, King James will say Christ died in vain. So Christ died that those that are sinners might be able to find grace through Jesus Christ. Now go with me to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 and there verse 12. Before we go to verse 12, let me explain a little bit about what's going on. Jesus has gone to Matthew, the tax collector. The tax collectors were the worst kinds of Jews. And Jesus said to Matthew, follow me. And they had dinner together. And the Jews are asking questions. And verse 11, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why is Jesus, why is this great rabbi associating with sinners? Jesus knew their hearts and he began to answer. He says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but who? Those that are sick. Only the sick need the doctor. Then he goes, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but who? Sinners, my friend. If you are righteous, or if you believe that you are righteous, or if you believe that you're going to attain righteousness, on your own and because of your works. You have cut off Jesus in your relationship. Because Jesus didn't come for the righteous. He came for those that are sinners. Go with me to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. 
And there we find a story of a very sad and oppressed woman. Verse 24, so Jesus went with him, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. So she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. And at once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, who touched me? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. When the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear and told him the whole truth, he said, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Verse 36. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him. They said, These are people now... Uh, Asking Jesus questions. Let me read that as well. Verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. Jesus had just shown an example of a woman who was sick and her belief healed her. Because of her condition, she was considered unclean and a sinner. That's the way Jewish, uh, Jewish law was. She couldn't go to the temple. She couldn't worship. She couldn't be with the family. She couldn't be with the people. When Jesus healed her, this also indicates a healing, not only of a physical healing, of a physical ailment, ailment but also the spiritual God healed her of her sin and gave her righteousness. This is a person who is sick. Now read on. Verse 37, he did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. What happened? Immediately she got up and started to walk around. Did it take her a little while? Did she wake up and say, no, my body won't let me to sit up. No, I cannot sit in bed. Oh, no, my legs hurt. I cannot stand up. She was made whole and she was made completely whole. Right then, immediately, she was considered completely perfect. The way she's supposed to be. Turn to the Romans. Chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, and there, verse 16, Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace, and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those that have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. By the way, when it says those that are of the law, it doesn't mean those that are keeping the law. It means those that know the law. That's the Jews. And the others who don't know the law, or that are not under the law, the Gentiles. Those are not of the law. He is the father of us all, meaning he is the father of both the Jews and the Gentiles. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead calls into beings things that are things that were not. You get that? 
You get that? Those that were dead in sin, those that were dead to sin, those that were under the law are declared alive by Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ, like that young girl with the symbology of the daughter of Jairus. Where that same God who takes and heals the sinner or heals that sick, that same God raises those that are spiritually dead. And before God, he counts them righteous right then, not a little at a time. No, he's a little righteous now. He's a little more righteous then. And he's going to get it. Eventually, he'll begin to walk. Nah. That is why. That is why. The Bible teaches us that God did not take away the sin of Adam and Eve. He covered it. You get it? He covered it. With Moses. Sorry, with Abraham. He covered his sin. That's why Romans chapter 4, once again, You find verse 3. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. We know Abraham did many unrighteous things. But God covered his sin because of the Jesus that was going to come. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ. Moses and the children of Israel. The law came and it showed them the sin. And that law was put inside the Ark of the Covenant. And the sins of the people were covered once again by the mercy seat. What does the word atonement mean? What is the word atone? To atone. At one. The spelling of atone? At one. That means on that day of atonement, the annual day of atonement, the people of God and God himself were at one. They were once again in harmony on the day of atonement. No judgment on the day of atonement. In harmony, where God covered the sins of the nation, of all the people. God covered their sin. And what was the feast that took place immediately after the day of atonement? Feast of Tabernacles is correct. This is where God and his people we're able to abide and live together. That symbolizes eternal life in heaven. Eternal life in heaven. The grace of God, right through Scripture, from start to finish, from the sin of Adam, from the sin of Adam, right to the book of Revelation. When the Bible says, here are those that keep the commandments of God. It doesn't say, here are those that keep the fourth commandment of God. It doesn't say that at all. Now, I happen to believe, and you can look, look up the scripture. Hebrews chapter 4 discusses this as well. The Sabbath day, the seventh weekly day of the week, is still in play. God will expect me to keep the Sabbath day holy. But the keeping of the Sabbath day holy is not the sign or the seal that saves me or gives me salvation. That is wrong. When Revelation says, here are those that keep the commandments of God, plural, is that here are those that keep the commandments of God in Jesus Christ and are covered. These are the churches. These are my people. Don't let anybody mislead you. We are covered by the blood of the Lamb. But that does not mean that we live outside the law. 
That means that the law lives inside of us. That means that the law is written in the hearts of the people. That's why the Apostle Paul says, that which I want to do. Why does he want to do it? Because the law is now in his heart. When the law is in your heart, we want to do this. We want to follow the law. But sometimes because of our humanity, we are we're unable to keep it. Satan, over the centuries, tried to destroy the message of salvation. Right from the beginning, he was able to turn the entire world pagan and against God. So thus came Noah. Then came Abraham. Then came Moses. Then came David. Then came Jesus. It was always a war between Satan and God. And God allowed Satan a certain time until the fulfillment of the coming of Jesus Christ. Then when Jesus came, Satan tried to destroy Jesus through Herod by trying to kill him, the baby. Then when Satan tried to take him up in a high place and told him to jump, once again he's trying to interfere with the plan of redemption. Then there were people who tried to throw him off of a cliff and Jesus disappeared. Satan trying to interfere with the plan of salvation. Then when Jesus was, was on the cross, Satan thought he had won. When Jesus was resurrected. When the gospel of Jesus Christ began to be preached. Satan through the zealots tried to cover the gospel of Jesus Christ of grace. And tried to teach this new gospel. To which the apostle Paul says, who has brought you this gospel? This new gospel which is no gospel at all. I am astonished, Galatians chapter 1, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. What is gospel? Gospel is good news. So he says, this is no good news at all. Why are you turning to this? And what was this? That you have to be circumcised. And for those, by the way, who believe that the book of Galatians is only about, or mostly about the law of Moses, it's not. Because circumcision was a sign of the covenant with Abraham, not Moses. The sign of the covenant with Moses was the Sabbath. This is a discussion on circumcision. So let's be careful when we study the scriptures. As we have already said, now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, let them be under God's curse. In the King James it says, let them be anathema. Why have you turned? The Apostle Paul brought the gospel to the churches. The churches that he established, he wasn't able to go to Rome, we know that. He warns everybody, but you know, sad things, about 70 years after the Apostle Paul, most of the churches went back into trying to attain their righteousness by their works. Not long after that, so many pagans were converted into the Christian church because it was becoming popular to become Christian. That the teachings of paganism where you are able to attain eternal life or a better life through living a good life, that found its way, that teaching found its way into the Christian church. You know that most religions that deal with afterlife teach that if you live a good life, if you earn lots of points with God, you're going to go to heaven. Islam teaches that. Hinduism teaches that in a roundabout way through a reincarnation that you can get a higher life form and a higher life form. Eventually, you become part of the nirvana and part of the universe. But Christianity was different. Christianity said, by grace through faith. That's how you're saved. But the pagan teachings of righteousness by works found their way into the church. The Roman Catholic Church then devised plans on how a person may find salvation. Because of the shortness of time, I'm going to give you just a summary of it. 
What is the Roman Catholic teaching? And when I say Roman Catholic, by the way, no matter what denomination you belong to, the mother church is Roman Catholic. That's where we all came from. That's where we all came from. You like it or not, our roots are there. Until the Reformation, which was started before Luther, but Luther was a bit more stubborn. And God worked things out where the Reformation could become successful. But until then, actually even today, the Roman Catholic Church teaches the same thing. Which is what? That we are sinners? And how do we attain salvation? We attain salvation by confession of sin and by baptism. And there is grace involved and there is faith involved. The faith gives you the grace that you may be baptized. But once you're baptized, you have to add to that your works, keeping the law. You have to be sinless. Now, once you are in grace, you can remain in grace, and you can be guilty of two different kinds of sin, venial sins and mortal sins. Venial sins are little sins that you're still in grace, and you have little sins, you go confess to the priest, then you can take communion and you go through the sacramental system, and you're still within the protection of God's grace. However, if you're guilty of mortal sins, and breaking of any of the Ten Commandments is a mortal sin, so if you're coveting, it's a mortal sin. So any mortal sin, now you've got a problem. Because you need righteousness. And no matter what you do, you don't have enough righteousness. So without using Roman Catholic terminology, basically what you have to do is you have to depend on the indulgences. You have to depend on the righteousness of saints. That's why they have all these saints. Because the saints have lived so well and so holy that they have more righteousness than they need. So you can then get some of that righteousness transferred onto yourself by the indulgences. And you can become saved. If, however, you are short and you're still not righteous enough, when you die, you end up in a place called purgatory. P-U-R-G-A-T-O-R-Y. Purgatory, why? P-U-R-G, where you get purged. You get purged of sin. And your relatives can make arrangements for indulgences on your behalf. So you may go from purgatory to heaven eventually. It may take a year, it may take two years, it may take five million years. We don't know. Unfortunately, when after Luther and the other reformers uncovered the doctrine of grace, there were some teachers, some reformers, who did not completely understand or reject the Roman Catholic teaching of salvation. Some of them retained the teaching that we are saved by grace plus our righteous works. So, everything that happens till the day that I accept Jesus Christ has been forgiven. But now from here on out, I've got to live a righteous life. The Bible doesn't teach that. In about three weeks, I'm going to give you the details of that theology and what road that theology took to find its way into the church in which I grew up. That Roman Catholic teaching of salvation by grace and works is alive and well, my friends, in the Seventh-day Adventist church today. Their teachers and theologians will tell you that's not true. But read the great controversy. Read Ellen White, where she tells you that your character must be pure. She says, until the character of Jesus Christ is reproduced in all his people, which is the remnant, which is the Seventh-day Adventist, Christ will not come. Christ will not come. On the, on the question of the plan of redemption, 
In the plan of redemption, she says this. That Jesus went to the Father. And Jesus pleaded to the Father that he may become the sacrifice on behalf of humanity because angels' death wouldn't do the trick. So God agreed with Jesus Christ to let him come down to this earth and be the savior of humanity. This is Ellen White. What nonsense. The Bible clearly says before the foundations of the earth, God had a plan of salvation in place. It was God's desire that Jesus come. Jesus said in Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done. What kind of garbage are we teaching our people? This is not biblical. Not biblical. We need to study the scriptures because in them we find the truth. In the Bible we find the truth. That we stand guilty before God. And we look at the mirror that is called the law. The Apostle Paul says that law is a teacher. Is a slave master. It's a mirror. That law lets me know there is something wrong with me. And that law directs me to Jesus Christ. So that I may accept Jesus Christ and through his perfect righteousness I may stand before God covered as Adam and Eve were covered right from the start. As the sins of Israel were covered by the mercy seat. You and I study, we stand guiltless before God That's just like on the day of atonement. Because we are sinless before God. Any works that we may do that are good are not our own. Those are the works of God who is living in me. That's why Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. You cannot bear fruit unless you are in the vine, unless you are connected. If you think that you can be a branch away from the vine, all on your own, you cannot bear fruit. Jesus said that that fruit comes from me being connected to you. Just like Jesus again, Jesus said, Matthew, that I do what I do by the power of God living in when the Bible says that Jesus is our example, that does not mean that I have to be a mini-me of Jesus. That doesn't mean that I have to go and imitate what Jesus did. I was in uh, India a few years ago, and this guy had these two little monkeys, all dressed up fancy, and they had this little drum that they play. And I uh, thought they were so cute, and I wanted to go and pat the monkey. He said, be careful, says, that monkey's going to bite you. I said, really? I backed off. So he said, let me introduce you. And he took names of two movie stars. I've forgotten which ones they were. He says, this is this movie star, and the female is this movie star. I said, really? No matter how well you dress up that monkey, and no matter how well that monkey dances, that monkey ain't no movie star. Doesn't work. No matter how hard I try to emulate Jesus to try and earn righteousness in my life, I'm still that monkey. Doesn't change who you are. It doesn't change who you are. When it says that we ought to be Using Jesus as our example, the message is this. Jesus says, as I live in the Father and as the Father lives in me, so the Father may live in you that you may be like me. That is the example. That's it. John chapter 17. Read it. Study it. Anything that good 
that comes out of any believer is the work of God in our lives. Let us not be fooled and let us not be mistaken by my message. I'm not stating at all that we do not have to ex expect God to transform us. But the Bible also tells me that if I say that I have attained righteousness, that alone cancels any righteousness that God may have had in my life. We continuously see sin in our lives. Why? Because God says, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. When am I ever going to achieve that? It's not going to happen. It will happen in Jesus Christ. And when the power of Jesus Christ comes in me, when God lives in me through His Spirit, those things that I may have liked before I begins to change. Those things I wanted to do before I no longer want to do. My greed, my pride, my selfishness, all of that begins to diminish by the power of God. And what is the final test that God gives us? It's simply this, and it's over and over again. The keeping of the law culminates in this. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. What that means is lack of selfishness, lack of self-centeredness. Lack of a preoccupation of being rich and famous. That is a sign that the Spirit of God is living in me. That when God gives me something, I can take that and share it with somebody else. The other day, you know, I, I'm not the best housekeeper in the world. In fact, I'm pretty poor. And uh, bad habit over the years, uh, rather than doing laundry at home, I take laundry out and have somebody do it. And uh, last few, ah, quite a while, I won't say how long, uh, I ran out of shirts, I go buy a shirt or two. And a couple of weeks ago, I decided I'd take the laundry to the laundromat and have somebody wash and fold and hang the shirts and so on, whatever they do with them. I you know, I didn't take all the shirts, I didn't take all the laundry, I only took some of it. But the shirts that are in good shape and relatively new, only worn a few times. There was 82 of them. Like, what's wrong with me? What? And I thought about it. That is just one example of my life. What else is there in my life where I'm not using the resources that God gives me for the things that God wants me to use them for? I, I know how I live. I could do with five shirts and I'm done. That's all I need. But 82? And that's not all of them. There's something wrong with me. God gives you a new heart that we become changed and we think about that brother who doesn't have any shirts. That brother and sister who doesn't have food. That is the measure of my righteousness. Not whether or not I keep the Sabbath. Go with me again to Mark. Chapter 5. I've turned my notes upside down. I was trying to decide what to delete or take out from the sermon today. So you'll pardon me if I'm a little bit slow. Mark chapter 7. No, sorry, Mark chapter 5. Uh, where am I? Uh, no, I think I'm looking for Luke. Luke. And funny enough, they're both in chapter 5. Chapter 5 of Luke. Once again, Jesus is talking to Matthew. This is the same story recorded by Luke. Jesus says in verse 31, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Now, as we continue in this passage, please note verse 34. Jesus answered, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? This is now the Jews are asking about the, why the disciples of Jesus are not fasting. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days, they will fast. Now, go on down, verse 38. No new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants a new, for they say the old is better. But do you know in this discourse... The, the next passage, the next passage that Luke covers is about how those Jews counted their righteousness. And do you know how it was? It was how well you observed the Sabbath. Chapter 6. Jesus is in the field and he takes some grain and he Puts it in his hand and he needs it. Gets a kernel, he eats some and so do his disciples. And the Pharisees, Pharisees come to him, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? I'm not going to dwell on this. Point is this. There are those among us today who, like me, observe the Sabbath and know that the Sabbath is holy, meant to be kept. But we make that the measure of our righteousness as these people did. Beware. Don't measure your righteousness by the Sabbath. Nowhere in Scripture are we told that one commandment stands above the others. In fact, we are told, if you break the least of the commandments, you're guilty of all. And yet we have people telling us that somehow in vision, the fourth commandment stands up higher than all the others. Once again, I say, nonsense. All of the law of God is important. And it can be kept. It can be kept. By the power of Jesus Christ. But at no point can I stand up and say that I am righteous. I cannot. Because my works and my tricks may be righteous like that monkey. But I remain that monkey. Until... I am adopted in the family of Jesus Christ. We are born in sin with Adam. And we are adopted into the family of Jesus Christ. Where we become from slaves, we become princes and princesses. No longer under the law, but under grace. By faith. God bless you. And let's come back and study next week. And by the way, I'm going to invite all and any of my Seventh-day Adventist friends who are watching online, to please take some time, make an appointment to participate with us next week. Keep on hand your pens, your paper, computers, laptops, because I'm going to give you a lot of information and I want you to check it. And then respond in defense of Ellen G. White and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Because I will tell you unabashedly that next week, Ellen White and her status as a prophet will be under attack from this pulpit. So, prepare, read your material, bring it with you, that we may search the scriptures to find eternal life. God bless you. Amen.